Hi, and welcome to this talk on embedded Rust. My name is Ulf, and I work for Red Hat on improving the connectivity options for embedded devices and ensuring they work with open source cloud native systems. Today, I'm excited to talk about Rust on embedded systems and the state of the LoRa ecosystem. I've been doing Rust and embedded for a little over a year, so I'm by, I'm by no means an expert in either but you can find experts in both areas in the Rust embedded community, which I'll talk about later. But let me start with some background on the work we're doing with LoRaWAN and the Drog IoT project. Drog IoT is an ecosystem built around the tools to write firmware with various connectivity options to the, on the device side and endpoints in the cloud for devices to send data to. In addition, the cloud side provide device management and integration with other services such as the Things Network for LoRaWAN. The goal is to provide other services such as digital twins, firmware over the air updates and integrations. And all projects are fully open source under the Apache 2.0 license and we do all development in an open community. So go to our website and check it out. So to Rust and uh, Embedded. Embedded systems are still largely written in C and C++ and for good reasons, because there's a lot of legacy libraries and tooling around. But when the Rust project started, it wasn't immediately clear that it would be such a good fit for embedded. But as the project matured and the core capabilities of the language was stabilized, several experienced embedded developers started the work of building the ecosystem. I think Rust is a great fit primarily because of three parts. Rust allows you to write safe code where uh, a lot of common programming mistakes simply cannot be made. Access to mutable state is checked at compile time, which means that you don't get the data races when you're doing multiple threads, for instance, and that's not certainly not that's just not possible in safe Rust. There are times when you have to write unsafe code, and of course it can be done, but then you're able to limit that to a very small area that you can audit manually. The Rust compiler produces fast code and, in some cases, better code than C compilers because its type system allows the compiler to potentially infer more uh, optimizations than a C compiler. But the best part, from my view, is the tooling. Rust has a build tool and dependency manager named Cargo, and it's used by most projects, embedded or regular applications alike. These libraries are usually published to a central repository, allowing you to easily mix and match libraries for your application. And some of the libraries work with only the core part of the language, which means that you can also use that library in your firmware. The hardware support for embedded Rust is focused around the most popular architectures. The ARM Cortex-M is the most mature, but support for other architectures such as RISC-V is improving. You can also run, uh, use Rust on AVR and ESP, but that requires uh, custom versions of the compilers. But among the uh, Cortex-M families, there are vendors such as STM32, Nordic NRF, NXP and ATSAM are well supported. You can also run it on the Raspberry Pi Pico. And for RISC-V, there, there are some new hardware around from Espressive and Sci-5 uh, that's worth looking into. So let's dive more into the embedded Rust uh, ecosystem. As mentioned earlier, Rust includes a dependency manager for libraries that you may use, and those libraries are called crates. In Rust, each chip has something called a peripheral access crate, and that provides safe access to the registers for the peripherals. This gives you compile time checks that you're not uh, doing register writes concurrently in your application without the proper safeguards or locking. A hardware abstraction layer is often defined uh, across a family of chips that have the same type of peripherals. And that sort of crate provide higher level implementation for uh, things like the UART, SBI, uh, and so on. And in order to make it easier for applications to work with multiple different SBI peripherals, there is an embedded HAL crate that defines the APIs, or traits as we call them in the Rust, for these peripherals. And then even the tools for flashing and working with the debug probes 
uh, exist in Rust. The probe RS project is a great toolkit you can use as a library and via command line tools that makes building and flashing firmware very similar to running regular applications. Frameworks for logging, doing on-device testing also exists in the ecosystem. Some of the uh, effort of maintaining HALs, APIs and coordinating uh, what's going on in the, is done by the Rust Embedded Working Group. This group also is involved in discussions around Rust language features and it maintains some of the uh, very commonly used crates like Embedded HAL or Cortex-M. And they also have a lot of learning material. Weekly meetings are held in the matrix.org chat where you can meet most embedded Rust developers. And if you want to get started, I recommend having a look at the Embedded Rust book, which introduces a lot of the ecosystem. Uh, the Discovery book provides training material for specific boards that get you started easily. And also there are workshops and uh, examples in the Drogue IoT project that you can make use of. In the Embedded C world, there is a lot of work going into the RTOS or real-time operating systems. In Rust, there are also a few RTOSs such as Toc or Hubris, but these bring with them a lot of custom tooling. And in my opinion, it's the need of an RTOS is maybe less in Embedded Rust because you have such uh, great uh, built-in tooling that allow you to pull in only the modules you need. Instead, you have several runtimes that help with some of the core functionality like task scheduling. Um, but one very interesting feature of Rust is uh, the support for writing asynchronous code uh, in an asynchronous way called async await. This allows you to write um, very, uh, uh, let's say, power efficient code where a task can automatically yield execution when it's waiting for things like uh, interrupts. And then the runtime can put the microcontroller to sleep until woken up by some external event. And the code is very easy to uh, reason and reason about and read. At the heart of the embedded uh, Rust async effort is the Embassy project, which is both a runtime for asynchronous tasks and a hardware abstraction layer. Uh, the runtime supports the STM32 devices and the NRF devices, and more and more um, chips are being supported as soon as we have the hardware and uh, we just enabled the um, code generation for those chips. Um, it's also possible to run Embassy on Linux, Mac, Windows and even WebAssembly in your browser. And Drogue device, which is like the Drogue IoT firmware project, it builds on top of Embassy providing examples and drivers geared towards IoT as well as a, an actor model which allows you to compose uh, embedded applications really nicely. So that's a quick intro to Rust. So let's move on to the LoRa 1 bits. LoRa support in Rust uh, have somewhat been a bit ad hoc. There are libraries that implement access to common Semtech-based radios, which can be also be used for non-LoRa protocols. And in addition, there's a project on implementing a Rust native packet codec and Mac layer. The packet codec can be used independently to encode, decode LoRaWAN packets, so you don't have to use it on a device. Um, whereas the Mac layer can also be used to implement a, a LoRa capable, a LoRaWAN capable node, and the Mac layer can interface with the different uh, C radio drivers as well. If there you don't have a Rust driver, it supports LoRaWAN 1.0.2 and Class A device behavior. And uh, you can use the Mac layer both in an event-driven or uh, asynchronous fashion. In uh, the Embassy and Drogue device projects we are working to provide integration with different LoRa drivers and uh, Mac layer that can all connect to providers such as the Things Network. We have uh, several examples available and we are adding more as we have the hardware uh, capable uh, available. We want to support the generic node platform as part of this and particularly the flash size so that makes it attractive for us to experiment with firmware over the air updates as well. Um, we already have a workshop that you can check out if you want to try out a fully open source Rust firmware connecting to uh, the Things Network. Um, on the positive side of uh, the generics node support, um, um, even though we don't have a built-in example for a generic node, we have um, support for the, both the um, 
the microcontroller and the uh, radio. And there ex ex exists examples that you can use to connect to the Things Network. Um, there all actually exists two different HALs, one that is blocking and one that's part of Embassy, the asynchronous uh, runtime. The Tracker Edition the microcontroller is supported, but as far as I know, there is no driver for the radio yet. That might be an interesting project for someone who wants to get familiar with embedded Rust and join the community. Um, ongoing work on the Mac layer is to support other classes of LoRaWAN devices and looking at the uh, one newer, uh, newer versions of the spec. Um, on the radio side, there are more radios that need drivers and integrations with the Mac layer. And in the end, we want more examples to uh, show that Rust really supports uh, LoRaWAN. So that was a very quick uh, introduction to the world of embedded Rust. And there are probably some other projects here involved that I have forgotten. Apologies for that. Um, but I want to thank all of the um, Rust embedded community and those who set out to build the foundations of that. And by joining the community, you can learn more about embedded Rust, meet lots of uh, firmware developers doing interesting projects and participate. In the same way as other projects in the embedded community, the Drogue IoT community hangs out in the matrix.org chat. And you can find a lot of articles about embedded Rust and IoT in our blog. Thank you for your time.